Greetings to everyone and good morning. It is great to see so many attendees on the meeting today and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks as well to our speakers today, Brad and Christine from CCMTA and Barbara and G from the FMCSA. Thanks also to Chris and all the other staff with our Transportation Learning Network for their help in coordinating this meeting. And finally, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration for the grant funding that made our work and these webinars possible. For those who don't know me, my name is Brenda Lance and I'm the Associate Director of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University, as well as the Program Director for our Commercial Vehicle Safety Center. We're excited to have you join us today. The webinar today on cannabis legalization is the second in a series of follow-up webinars from the Western Commercial Vehicle Safety and CDL Compliance Summit we held in Denver this past November that many of you attended. For those who did attend, you might recall that our opening plenary session at the summit had speakers discussing the decriminalization of marijuana uh, in both Washington and Colorado. And it was during that discussion at that session that the idea for this webinar was suggested. So we plan to continue these webinars about once a month and suggestions for topics for future webinars are always welcome. As we proceed with today's webinar, feel free to use the chat box, as Chris had mentioned, to type in any questions that come up. In addition, we'll take questions and have discussion after the presentations as long as we have time. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Brad Holland is the Vice President of the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators. Christine Legrand is the Programs Manager for the Program Committee on Road Safety Research and Policies at CCMTA. Barbara Baker is a Transportation Specialist in the Compliance Division of FMCSA. And G. Marshall is a Management Analyst in the Office of Enforcement at FMCSA. We also have Jennifer Lancaster, a new Entrant Program Specialist with FMCSA, joining us as a panelist. Brad, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Brenda. And uh, I want to uh, thank everyone um, at FMCSA, our FMCSA partners, and Brenda for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, some of our learnings, growing pains, and experiences in Canada related to the process of cannabis legalization. Now, we're, we're really at the beginning of the journey, but we've been on this path for about two years as an organization. And so uh, we want to share with you today you know, some of the, the lessons learned and uh, the role that we played in helping our members, um, uh, you know, face some of the issues and challenges of cannabis legalization and impaired driving. So first today, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about CCMJ and who we are and our priorities, and then we'll give you a bit of a background about Bill C-45 and C-46, the two pieces of federal legislation around cannabis legalization that impacts our members. And then we'll talk about our, our experiences leading up to um, having discussions with the federal government and uh, making our concerns known around impaired driving. Uh, and then I understand that there's an opportunity for questions at the end of the session. So I think uh, it's important that uh, people understand who the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators uh, are. So we're an incorporated legal not-for-profit entity. Um, we've been around for about 75 years. We uh, have our members uh, composed of federal provincial and territorial um, governments in highway safety and transportation. And really, we act as a forum for those you know, governments to come together and discuss and collaborate on current and emerging road safety challenges. And so we work through three program committees at CCMTA. One is Compliance and Regulatory Affairs, and they really focus on commercial vehicle safety and the National Safety Code in Canada, drivers and vehicle licenses, and they deal with driver and vehicle licensing and registration in Canada, and then our, our road safety research and policies. And, and they really look at current emerging um, research needs on road safety, both you know, for us as an organization and also the activities going on in Canada. And additionally, we have 140 associate members who we consult with on road safety issues and challenges and uh, some, some of the current and uh, future trends that we see. So, that's kind of a bit of a background on our organization. So everything around CCMTA in the last 20, 25 years has been really focused around our road safety strategies. And so they're the pillar of a lot of the work that we do in our organization. And so Canada was one of the first um, countries to have a road safety strategy. And we really started back in 1996 with our 2001 vision, uh, road safety vision. And from that point, we've had three successive road safety strategies. Uh, and the last one was the Road Safety Strategy 2025, which was introduced in January 2016 by our Minister's Responsible for Transportation and Highway Safety. And so all of these have been developed uh, with our jurisdictions, our provinces and territories coming together, looking at and focusing on what are the big factors in road safety that we can collectively come together and have an impact on. And so it's really around uh, what we work on today is, is the goal of Towards Zero 
and the stasis rows in the world. So we, we put up um, this chart to take a look at, you know, some of the successes we've had over the last 20 plus years. So when we started with our road safety uh, strategy back in 1996, we had about over 3,000 uh, fatalities on our roads. And over the last 20 years, we've been able to drive that down to about, uh, in 2014, to just over 1,800 fatalities. And, you know, that's really um, as a result of our, our provinces and territories coming together with the federal government to look at how we can impact and uh, make changes around public education awareness, uh, putting the right legislation and regulations in, in place, really having a true partnership with enforcement and looking at how we can uh, mitigate some of the issues we have uh, on the roads, using education and training, and, and specifically lately, whether it's on distracted driving or on alcohol and drug impairment, looking at how technology uh, can have an impact on road safety as well. So collectively, we've come together uh, and worked on, on putting these tools in place to get the decline we've seen on fatalities in our country. And it's probably similar to many other countries and, and states, you know, after 2014, we've seen a bit of an uptake, uh, uptick in fatalities, uh, but we're monitoring that to see whether there are some, some uh, issues, whether it's speed, aggressive driving, uh, whether it's also around uh, alcohol and obviously with drug impairment uh, that cause that. So, you know, this is just to say that right now, uh, as everyone knows, with the cannabis legalization in Canada, that has been a priority focus of our, our provinces and territories, how to deal with that for the past two years. So, you know, if we look at uh, 2014, we have data from our Canadian coroners that show that about 42% of fatally injured drivers have been using drugs compared to 28% who have been using alcohol. And, you know, no surprise to anyone, the most commonly detected uh, drug in the coroner's report was cannabis. Now, one of the things we've additionally done in Canada is roadside surveys. I know that many states do roadside surveys as well. Uh, we conducted surveys in 2012 in British Columbia and 2014 in Ontario. And once again, you know, drugs are similar or more prevalent among drivers than alcohol. And once again, the most common drug found in these drivers was cannabis. So based on, on the research and the data that we had uh, at the time, you know, our members uh, made this the number one priority for us you know, over the last two years. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of a history of, of the cannabis legalization, just a background about uh, what went on. So it was a major campaign platform for uh, Justin Trudeau, our current Prime Minister, at the Liberal Party. He was elected in 2015. And shortly after the election, uh, three ministers, the Minister of Justice, Minister of Public Safety, and Minister of Health announced the creation of a, a nine-member task force, Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, to study the issue. At the same time, uh, a discussion paper that was prepared by the government uh, towards the legalization, regulation, and restriction of access to marijuana uh, was released, and that informed the task force's work and helped uh, to focus the input that they uh, received over the course of, of their activity. So the task force was uh, uh, delivered a mandate to consult and provide advice on the design of a new legislative and regulatory framework for legal access to cannabis. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the task force engaged um, with many, many different uh, bodies, provincial and territorial governments, experts, patients, um, advocates, uh, non-government organizations, indigenous communities, um, employees, uh, industry, and, and heard from individual Canadians as well, and uh, considered all of this information over the course of, of uh, a few months, from June to November. And then they released a final report of the task force in November of 16. And all of this uh, information uh, was related to some public policy objectives, um, keeping cannabis out of the hands of children and youth, and keeping profits out of the hands of organized crime. But they, they also looked internationally to inform their, their information. So south of the border, as Brad had mentioned, to some of the jurisdictions that already have uh, legalized cannabis. And then, uh, this resulted in the uh, two bills that were introduced, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, following, Bill C-45, which is the Cannabis Act, and Bill C-46, um, an act that's related to the criminal code changes. 
So if it's, you know, different than the the, uh, the U.S. experience where it's been going state to state, obviously, you know, we're doing this on a national basis, but, you know, our jurisdictions each have a lot of autonomy uh, in the way that they handle um, the way that they address impaired driving. Uh, so Bill C-45, which is our Cannabis Act, was introduced in April uh, 2017 by the Minister of Justice at the time. And the bill really permits non-medical use of cannabis in Canada and is intended to regulate and control the use of cannabis. Uh, and so it was passed by our, our House of Commons in December 2017, and I went back to the Senate. Uh, Senate made amendments, and I went back to the House. Uh, and so it was passed by the Senate finally on June 19, 2019. So it, it's very recent. So our, our provinces and jurisdictions between the, the time the federal government came in to the time that it's actually uh, the bill's become effective, there was not a lot of time. And I think a, a lot of the issues and challenges, and I'm not sure the states face the same challenges with, with a truncated timeline to deal with this from a federal and a national level. Alongside Bill C-45 was introduced Bill C-46. And, um, you know, this act was introduced to strengthen existing drug impaired driving laws and, and create a regime that would be amongst the strongest in the world. So before, before I get into the specific parts of the act that are of interest, I think it's important to note that you know, drug impaired driving has been a criminal offense in Canada since 1925. And since 2008, police have been authorized to demand um, an SFST test or standard field sobriety test at roadside and to conduct uh, DRE evaluations at the station. And that prior to Bill C-46, many Canadian jurisdictions already had uh, administrative programs to address a drug-impaired driver uh, in place. So, for example, a suspension at roadside. So this isn't a new concept, per se. It's, it's an act that included many amendments and aspects that were intended to strengthen the existing legislation. So in terms of the act itself, it's broken into two parts. Part one, uh, it makes amendments to the criminal code and, and creates new offenses. So there were three new offenses introduced. And it also authorized the police to use new investigative tools, namely uh, oral fluid screening devices, to better detect drivers um, while impaired by cannabis or other drugs, detect the presence of. Um, so the new offenses that were introduced, there were three. Uh, two drug offenses and one what we call a hybrid offense, a drug and alcohol offense. A THC level between 2 and 5 nanograms within 2 hours of driving, and that's 2 and 5 nanograms in blood, uh, carries a fine of up to $1,000. Um, a THC level above 5 nanograms within 2 hours of driving carries the same penalties as uh, alcohol and care driving, and uh, it's a mandatory minimum penalty of a $1,000 fine on a first offense, and then a second offense is 30 days imprisonment, and uh, a third offense 120 days. And then finally, the hybrid offense is a mixture of THC above 2.5 in blood and a blood alcohol concentration above 50 uh, milligrams per 100 milliliters. Um, and it would have the same penalties that I just noted, uh, $1,000 fine, 30-day imprisonment on the second offense, and um, 120 days on the third. Um, and note here, too, that the provinces and territories may add or can, they have uh, discretion to add additional penalties on top of these. The second piece of the new uh, investigative tools, the oral fluid screening devices, the, the act allows for the use at roadside of oral fluid screening. It specifically states that the screeners need to be tested and approved by the Attorney General of Canada. So the Drugs and Driving Committee developed um, standards and reviewed submissions from manufacturers to determine which devices um, can be tested to, and, and, and then recommended to the Attorney General and approved for use. Currently in Canada, we have one device that is approved for use, and we understand that there are a couple more uh, in consideration. Part two of the bill really is, is the piece that strengthens and modernizes the approach. Um, and it, it, it came into effect 180 days later. I'm not going to get into the differences, but really it's modernizing uh, and strengthening the offenses that already exist. And, and um, there were some additional pieces that relate to alcohol, but I won't go into that now because we're going to talk to you about cannabis today. So I, I think an important aspect is that in Canada compared to the states in some, some uh, ways is that, you know, there are a lot of interdependencies in the way that uh, we've had to approach, uh, you know, the cannabis legalization and um, the issues around drug-impaired driving. So in the case of uh, Canada, you know, the federal government really has taken a, a major role. Because public safety, uh, you know, facilitated 
and consulted with the provinces and territories on the drug-impaired driving aspect of the legislation. And our organization, CCMTA, with our members, we work both uh, directly with public safety, but also through the different uh, provincial, territorial, and federal forums. And the Rural Canadian Mounted Police, which is, uh, you know, basically a national police force, and they, who, who are under public safety, they basically led uh, the work on the changes in training modules for officers, uh, whether it's on oral fluid screening devices and operationalization, standard field sobriety tests uh, to make it more uh, comprehensive for uh, drug impairment, as well as the drug recognition evaluation training. So, so they took a, a major lead on that, whether it was online or in-person training and uh, uh, working with other police agencies and forces across Canada. And justice, the Department of Justice here or obviously oversees the Criminal Code of Canada changes. And when Christine talked about setting the THC limits for impaired driving, oral fluid screening devices, as well as, you know, the certification and technical standards around oral fluid screening devices. Uh, as you could understand, Health Canada, you know, oversees um, certain aspects of the Cannabis Act about, you know, setting minimum regulations regarding possession limits and age restrictions for our citizens and the licensing of cannabis producers and the conditions for or um, cultivation of cannabis and working with the provinces and territories around, you know, obviously each province was looking at different um, distribution models uh, within their provinces. And so Health Canada works with them on that as well. And then Transport Canada, who is a member of CCMTA, uh, obviously does a lot of the environmental work and provided technical uh, support and equipment for jurisdictions as we did some of the research on, uh, on roadside surveys. Uh, and they also supported the data in terms of collision data, fatality database analysis, uh, and some of the other research proposals. And last, of course, is our, our members, which are our jurisdictions, the province and territories. And they really look after, as Christine said, the administrative laws on alcohol and drug impaired driving, different ways to approach this, uh, this problem besides the criminal code um, way of, of dealing with it. And they also are in charge of the enforcement of the law. So whether it's the purchase of oral fluid screening devices and their training, uh, training on SFST with their officers, DREs, and they also had to deal with the changes due to the renumbering of our impaired driving sections of the criminal code and the administration of justice in the end. So all of these parties had to come together uh, and find a way to work and collaborate to get to where we are today. And it's still, it's still a learning process. There's still a lot of deliberations going on. I think that's an important uh, point to make. So how did CCMTA engage on this issue throughout the whole process? Um, you know, Fred mentioned a lot of the interdependencies, and we were woven in, in many of those discussions throughout the process. Early on, in terms of the federal task force, we uh, engaged with uh, our partners to identify a number of areas of concern, and um, we conveyed those issues to the federal government uh, and to the, the task force. So a number of the issues here listed on the screen, key considerations, included timing. So Brad alluded to that, the aggressive timelines. They needed to get time to put in place the legislative and regulatory regimes. Um, in some instances, jurisdictions needed information from the other departments. Those interdependencies really played a role uh, about informing decisions. We can't make a decision on X until we know what Y is going to be. Um, oral fluid testing devices, uh, we knew that the, the devices would be approved, but we, the jurisdictions had many questions relating to the timelines and how they would be approved, when the standards would be in place, and would the approval process be aligned with the actual legislation proposed, the, the date proposed for legalization. Um, they needed information for training, uh, procurement of devices, resources, changing their internal systems. Many aspects of Bill C-46 involved um, a, a whole renumbering of their systems in, in terms of what their, their, uh, their IT support and their logistics pieces needed to, to um, uh, have to support the federal level changes. Uh, discussions took place related to zero tolerance administrative laws uh, and whether those could be actually introduced and who, who would, they would apply to. Um, many public education and awareness messages were discussed, research gaps, and again, medical cannabis. How does this medical cannabis regime, which already exists in Canada, how is this impacted or how, does this, uh, how is this considered in light of the introduction of Bill C-45 and 46? And for every challenge here on the screen, um, there, were, there were funding requirements and human resource requirements. So 
throughout the process, there was a little bit of uncertainty and questions related to where would funding come from, and, and we knew there was money put aside. Jurisdictions were aware of that, but what it could be used for, how much each jurisdiction was going to uh, be able to tap into, and what they would be using it for, what kind of costs would be involved. Those were all questions we raised with the Federal Task Force on behalf of our members. Um, it, we also uh, developed internally a cannabis impaired driving working group. Um, it was a task force created under the RRSRP, so the Road Safety Research and Policy Committee, uh, and identified and prioritized activities that could help support members as we move through this process. We initially developed a working paper, or a white paper, sorry, uh, on, on cannabis impaired driving uh, so that members could have a common understanding. And there was a lot of education and information sharing initially to make sure we were all singing from the same song sheet, if you will. We all had the same understanding and knowledge base going in. There's a lot of learning. Um, we, our, our white paper uh, provided some next steps to the different levels of government. We drew on experiences and lessons learned from other areas. And then we finally highlighted some issues that we thought we would need to consider moving forward. We pr produced a review of jurisdictional activities. What are the administrative impaired driving laws that we currently have? What kind of considerations are jurisdictions moving towards as we move forward? Um, what kind of legal advice have they received? Uh, what public education and awareness campaigns exist? Uh, what kind of messages need to be created, who's creating those and how can we leverage them, and research. What, what actually is going on here in Canada? What gaps can we um, identify and where do we need to look to, uh, to improve uh, some of the research areas and fill some of those gaps? Um, we did, as I mentioned, have a, a discussion with our members early on about zero tolerance administrative laws. And, and it really, through our discussions, members came together. Provinces and territories uh, have uh, zero tolerance limits for young and novice drivers for alcohol, but none had this for drugs. And so there was a lot of discussion around uh, who we could target and, and how we could uh, uh, um, come together collectively so that cross-border we might have some commonalities. And there was a uh, agreement. Initially, uh, discussions led to three groups, novice drivers, age-based drivers, so uh, young and novice drivers, and, and commercial drivers. Um, uh, those proposed categories for uh, where zero tolerance limits would, would be uh, implemented. And we knew that we had the support from organizations and other stakeholders like uh, MAD Canada or uh, our, our enforcement community, the Canadian Chiefs of uh, Police. Um, and various trucking associations who, who supported um, many of these decisions. And as jurisdictions move forward with the development of the sanctions to address the changes, um, you know, they took into consideration their jurisdictional uh, considerations and, and existing frameworks, so what ages do they have already for alcohol, and, and they vary uh, from province to province and territory. Um, and so they took into consideration and these, and they had some jurisdictional autonomy in moving forward. But initially, this was the, the groups that we came together for uh, uh, discussions and, and for um, our discussions with the federal government. So uh, no, no surprise to anyone on the phone, you know, public education and awareness is, is, is key to, uh, you know, distilling some of the myths around um, cannabis and fair driving. And so we all know that studies have shown that, you know, drivers often perceive themselves as better drivers uh, under the influence of cannabis. And on top of that, you know, many drivers believe that the chance of getting caught for cannabis impaired driving are much lower than for alcohol impaired driving. And, you know, we've, we've, we've seen some research around this, specifically with the youth. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've done some research uh, and we, we took a look at, um, you know, what education campaigns have gone on in the past and, uh, you know, no surprise, there's never been a lot of evaluations of those. So, you know, moving forward uh, as a group, you know, our different uh, province and territories, just like the states, have different ways to approach this and, and uh, whether it's uh, social media campaigns or uh, edgy or radio campaigns. And so our, our members come together and they share uh, best practices, lessons learned. Uh, we're trying to see what evaluations have done to see what is the best way to approach this issue. And the federal government, as part of their you know, um, mandate uh, had also put the money on the table for $10 million to 
look at what public education awareness campaigns should be put in place and, and jurisdictions could participate in that or not. So that's kind of where things are at on public education awareness. But there are a lot of discussions going on uh, with different groups in Canada, both in government and, and non-government organizations, about what is the best way uh, to get the message out. Basically, don't, don't drive high. Uh, so uh, we continue to work on this. And, um, you know, it, it, it's something that uh, will probably be a priority for our organization over the next couple of years. But we're just at the beginning of this journey, so uh, it, it's hard to know where we're going yet. I mean, we've, we've looked at Washington, we've looked at Colorado State, we've, we've learned from them, and we've had Darren come up and talk to us. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to put all the pieces together. So one of the things that we did early on is, uh, you know, obviously enforcement, there, to Christine's point, you know, there's a lot of concern about the timing and, and you know, this is suddenly going to be before us. How are we going to operationalize this? How are we going to respond to this? And it said it, it really took a lot of collaboration from the federal government and our provinces and territories to come together and put together the pieces, whether it's, uh, you know, enforcement training uh, and education, putting together the, the programs, the online programs, et cetera. One of the areas where CCMCA thought we could bring value is to, uh, to partner with uh, public safety uh, around oral fluid screening devices. So we did a pilot project where we, we had three oral, oral screening uh, fluid devices, and we partnered with several enforcement uh, law agencies across the country to do a, uh, a short-term pilot to see what it was like to operationalize these units in the field. And so obviously, just like, you know, whether it's North Dakota, South Dakota, the far south, there are issues around temperature. There are issues around... Uh, keeping the unit level or warm in the car. So we uh, were able to collect this data, and, and that helped inform the federal government as well and the certification process for these devices going forward. So we've alluded to the roadside surveys um, before in the presentation, and so pre-legalization, it was important to uh, to continue to gather as much information as we could. Um, we use a, uh, a protocol uh, developed by Transport Canada, and uh, five jurisdictions undertook roadside surveys to establish some baseline data prior to legalization. BC, uh, Manitoba, Ontario, and then two in our north, northern uh, communities, the Yukon Territory and the Northwest Territories. So we have information from five Canadian jurisdictions pre-legalization on alcohol and drug use uh, from our roadside survey, and we're currently consolidating that data uh, to establish the baseline, and, and we anticipate that we'll have some results by June of this year. And as part of this work, it's important to continue to monitor and, and um, get data on, on prevalence and, and use by drivers. So we are, there are plans to conduct post uh, uh, roadside survey so that we will have the much needed information to continue to follow the, uh, the impact or the, to understand if there is an impact on cannabis legalization on driving road safety. And we know that road research is, is essential to understand um, what the impact will be moving forward. So in addition to the research that we've described, uh, we help, we, CCMTA publishes an annual alcohol and drug crash report, and that's based on coroner and collision data that we've been co collecting, or jurisdictional members have been collecting since 2000 at least for drugs. Um, and CCMTA members are also working with uh, a researcher, Dr. Jeff Brubaker, he's in, in BC, to support his research assessing alcohol and drug use by drivers in collision. This is hospitalized hospital data. Uh, he's been doing this work in BC and looking to uh, move out to other jurisdictions so that we have, again, some baseline data, some understanding what is the prevalence of use in, in injured drivers. Um, we will have some data there, so some of our jurisdictions are working on that. We know that there's more research that's still needed. There's need for a consistent approach to testing methods used by coroners. Um, we know that there's other baseline data. And, and, and we also know that there's a lack of data. Uh, so the good news is that there is a mandate within these bills to monitor the impact. Um, public safety is working with our jurisdictions to identify and collect indicators that monitor the impact. And CCMTA, we've been involved in that process throughout. 
Um, and we continue to work with our federal, provincial, and territorial members um, on, on our data collection, monitoring, and surveillance to assess the impact as we continue to move forward. So that, that gives a, you know, an overview of, of where we've come from over the last two years. And it's really, you know, at this point, uh, following, you know, the royal assent of, of Bill C-45 and C-46, together, both as a membership and individually, the provinces and territories are continuing to monitor Kansas legalization and what the potential impact on road safety are. I said it's early days. I mean, enforcement has, has not taken a drastically different approach to drug impairment than they had before legalization, which is quite interesting considering the amount of discussion uh, that went around um, the issue of, of drug impairment. Uh, so, you know, we continue to have uh, dialogues with, with both our, our, our other NGOs, with the federal government, and with the provinces and territories about what's going on out there uh, in the environment and what are they seeing. And so, as you can understand, these are, these are discussions that happen uh, at the justice level and also uh, with our enforcement community. So everyone is very, there's a heightened awareness about, you know, are we seeing any trends? Are we seeing anything change? Uh, as I said, it's, it's very early days, so we'll be monitoring, the, monitoring that as we go forward. And, you know, additionally for us, you know, we have opportunities at our annual general meeting where we have educational sessions on uh, cannabis impaired driving and what research is going on out there. As I said, obviously Canada uh, in the last two years, the amount of funding for research around uh, impaired driving has increased quite substantially. So, you know, we've had a lot of, um, a lot, I mean, that's probably an overstatement, but we've had um, work done on uh, driver simulator studies in cannabis and so-called youth uh, to look at, at some of the impairment issues and challenges. So that has, uh, has kind of started to uh, start a new dialogue about what research is required going forward. Our members also, as I as mentioned before, continue to collaborate when we talk about public education and awareness and what's the best way to reach the different targeted uh, audiences. And that, you know, obviously we focus on, on youth, but you know, there's also been a, a bit of uh, discussion about uh, there being quite a bit of cannabis use amongst the uh, you know, 35 to 55 year olds as well, which uh, you know, it, it, I guess not surprising uh, overall and probably mirrors some of the stuff in Colorado and Washington State. So, you know, we're, we're well positioned, and it was pointed out we were at a, at a conference probably a week or two weeks ago, and we had some of our American colleagues out there just saying, well, you know, we're kind of well positioned to look at uh, cannabis research and cannabis research on impaired driving, and, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of, of Canada over the next couple of years. And, and that kind of gives a, a, you know, an overall state of where we're at today, and so we'll continue to monitor and surveil what's going on. And, and work together as, as current and, uh, and new issues emerge around uh, cannabis legalization. And I'd just like to thank everyone for the time today. I said it, it's a high-level uh, presentation. If anyone has more direct questions, our, our contact details are here, and we'd be more than happy to help. Thanks, Brad and Christine. That was great. And we do have uh, one question in the question box. Um, the question was, will you be tracking any change in how penalties are given out, especially the length of prison terms, depending on drug, alcohol, or hybrid impairment? All right. Yeah, our federal level, our justice group has been working to develop uh, and identify some of the indicators of how to, to collect that data. So there are currently some data sources available. And uh, it's public safety who's actually leading it, but those are justice data sets. Um, but they have uh, been discussing what indicators we have to be able to collect that, yes, and or how what we need to add to our data sets of what we're not collecting, which we should be collecting. So how do we enhance what we're already doing to be able to identify and follow some of that? So there, there have been discussions where that nets out or what exactly we'll be able to collect. I can't answer, but they're, they're certainly working on those areas, definitely without a doubt. Yeah, so, so there's been a lot of work bringing together uh, said, um, the academic, enforcement, uh, justice communities to have those discussions on, on really what we need to go forward. And everyone acknowledges that, you know, this, this is a, a bit of a, of a net new for us. And so we've, we've had to do a bit of a deep dive and identify gaps and, and where we need to go uh, in the future. Great. Thanks again, Brad and Christine. 
Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to type it into the question box. And I also want to mention that we did have an additional panelist uh, join us. Uh, Brian Price, the Chief of North American Border Division at FMCSA, is also on the line as well. And I do not see any further questions at this time. So, Barbara, I will turn it over to you. So this is Barbara, and I'm going to be talking um, through the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse, just giving an overview. Um, so we'll talk about what is the clearinghouse. We'll talk a little bit about the final rule, the timeline, where we currently are and where we're going to get to, how to use the clearinghouse, and then how to register, and then where to get more information. So we'll start with what is the clearinghouse and why we're going towards the clearinghouse direction. In today's world, um, CDL holders and CLP holders, if they have um, drug and alcohol violations, they're not being reported to a central system. Um, but we know that drivers who have these violations cannot operate a commercial vehicle and they must complete um, required drug and alcohol treatment and education before they will be allowed to start operating those vehicles. Currently, the drivers have to inform new employers of any driver drug and alcohol violations that they had with the previous um, employer, and the motor carriers must follow up with other prior drivers and prior employers for a driver before employing a driver. So there's a lot of manual processes that happen today or don't happen, um, which allows drivers who might have a positive drug or alcohol violation to continue to operate um, unsafely. So what is the clearinghouse? This will be a database that will contain um, CL holders and CLP holders drug and alcohol program violation. Medical review officers as well as employers will report to the clearinghouse and they'll report positive tests, refusals, actual knowledge violation. In addition, information about a driver completing the return to duty process um, will be entered into the clearinghouse and this will indicate that the driver can complete um, safety sensitive functions again. So the clearinghouse, one of the, the important tenets of it is that it will be a secure database only authorized users will be able to access it, and this includes both employers and FMCSA. All users will have to register for it and will have specific roles, and we'll talk through that a little bit later um, this morning. Other enforcement agencies, including the uh, SCLAs, the DMVs and such, as well as state and law enforcement agencies, they'll receive the driver eligibility status. So they'll get information on whether a driver has any um, positive uh, tests and if they've been cleared or not, if they're eligible to drive, but they will not receive the detailed information about the violations. Drivers will be able to access their own information at any time. Um, they will not have access to other drivers. They'll have to log in with their CDL information and we'll be able to give them only their result information. We'll also make sure that we meet any uh, relevant uh, federal standards for security. We'll continuously review those and evaluate them and adjust those as um, security stuff changes just to make sure that we really are um, meeting the security requirements and keeping the privacy um, as an important component of the clearinghouse. So why are we doing this? We really want to meet and obtain the goal of having safer roadways and in order to do that we're going to provide real-time access um, to the violation information. Um, this will make it more difficult for drivers to conceal violations, um, as well as providing more insight to employers of drivers' prior history with drug and alcohol, and making sure that, again, that they complete that in, uh, required return to duty and education. Um, so these things will all come together so that we meet that, that goal of having safer roadways and removing the unsafe drivers from the road. There you go. So what was the Clearinghouse final rule? It was mandated to us by Congress under Map 21, Section 32402, and it was actually published December 5th, 2016. We have a mandatory compliance date of January 6, 2020, and that's the point that violations will need to start getting 
report into the clearinghouse. The final rule, should folks want to go ahead and read it, that is available on the FMCSA website to find out all the details of it. So where are we and what's our timeline? Like I mentioned, December 5th, the rule was published. We're now in the information phase, and I know that that says February, but it was actually looking like it'll be March of 2019 since we finished February. And that's going to be a launch of what we're calling a communication website. What that will provide is general information about the clearinghouse and some FAQs, and it will allow for um, users to sign up for an email um, list, and then from that we'll be able to reach out and provide updates and other information about the clearinghouse. So like I said, that's any day now we should be publishing that. It's ready to go. We're just waiting for clearance from um, management to go ahead and post that. So that will, once that goes live, that will be the actual address of where the clearinghouse will be posted um, come January of 2020. So starting in October of 2019, that's when we'll open up the clearinghouse so users could go ahead and register and you'll be able to create an account. So we're opening that up before the actual implementation date so people can get started and create the uh, account and kind of get used to things a little bit. But we won't actually start um, collecting violations until the mandatory reporting date and that's the January 6, 2020. So once that happens, employers and MROs will be able to enter in violations that happen on or after the, the January 6th date. Um, employers will be able to use the clearinghouse to query and obtain drivers' tax drug and alcohol violation information, but because we'll only be storing violations that have happened on or after January 6th for anything prior, the employer will have to continue to do their manual queries like they do today. By January 6, 2023, that's when we'll hit our three-year mark. And at that point, the clearinghouse will contain three years of violation data. So the employers will no longer need to do manual queries to get prior drug and alcohol um, information. They'll be able to get all of their information for pre-employment and other things from the clearinghouse directly. So we're going to talk a little bit about using the clearinghouse as well as some FAQs. Um, and getting into the clearinghouse FAQs, we're looking specifically a little bit at how they impact Canadian users. Um, and the, the questions start with, are Canadian uh, drivers subject to the clearinghouse requirements? And yes, they are. So Canadian drivers that operate in the U.S., they're required to comply with the FMCSA drug alcohol requirements, and they're also required to comply with the clearinghouse requ uh, requirements. So they will be required to provide consent. They'll be required to um, have violations entered into them. Most Canadian employers report drug and alcohol violations to the clearinghouse. The answer is yes again here. Uh, Canadian employers who operate in the U.S., they're also subject to the FMCSA drug and alcohol test requirements, and they're also subject to the clearinghouse requirements. So they will need to do the queries annually for pre-employment as well as reporting violations. Can Canadian medical review officers report confirmed positive tests and refusals to the clearinghouse? Yes, they can, but those MROs must meet the requirements under Part 40, Section 121. Can Canadian um, SAPs or substance abuse professionals report the date of the initial assessment as well as the date that a driver is eligible for their return to duty testing? And yes, they, all, they can as well, but they meet, must meet their requirements under Part 40, Section 281. And then what about other FAQs and outreach material? As I mentioned before, we'll have the Clearinghouse um, website. We'll be updating things regularly with questions that we've gotten. Um, we'll have a fact sheet as well as additional information on it. And like I said before, you'll be able to sign up for email updates once that site becomes available. So we'll push out new information to um, folks that sign up for it. Who will be required to use the clearinghouse? Um, we'll talk a little bit more details on the next slide about this. But any driver who has a CDL or CLP, employers of those drivers, consortium or third party administrators, and the way that the rule was set up was that um, employers who are identified as owner operators will be required to select a consortium or third party administrator. Others it will be optional for. Um, MROs, SAPs will also be required to use the clearinghouse and then SCLAs will be able to um, query. We'll talk a little bit more details here. 
Um, this chart breaks down the different uh, user roles, like we just mentioned on the prior slide, the driver, employer, CTPA, MRO, and staff, and then it discusses um, what role each of them has. So everybody will be required to register. Employers, CTPAs, MROs, and staff can um, have assistance in the clearinghouse, and this will allow them to have additional people who can do data entry on their behalf. Um, an employer will be able to select the CTPA. Employers and CTPAs will be required to provide to obtain consent. Um, drivers will be required to provide that consent. And then the employers and the CTPAs will be able to query um, violation information and report uh, the violations. A driver will be able to select the staff within the clearinghouse. Um, the staff will then report on the RTD information for that driver. And then an employer and CTPA will report on follow-up testing information. Breaking down each of these individual users a little bit, all drivers will be able to register for the clearinghouse. They'll be able to view their own information and then provide specific consent. So consent will be required um, if an employer is doing a full query, and this includes pre-employment queries. Um, if the driver has tested positive, then they'll be able to select the staff within the clearinghouse. Um, drivers will actually enter in their CDL information and will verify that information against SIDLIS to ensure that the driver is who they say they are. Um, they'll also be able to enter in their contact information and choose the preferred contact method. So we'll be able to send either letters or preferably um, emails to the driver about actions that happen within the clearinghouse. Also, within um, the rule, it specifies that a driver may submit a petition if there's incorrect data, um, if the actual knowledge did not result in a conviction, or um, if there's failure to appear test refusals within the clearinghouse that are not within, in accordance with 382-705-B5. And the way that we are establishing that is that the drivers will go through the petition process through the data queue system. So they'll, they'll be using the system that already exists, and they'll be able to um, petition information that we have within the clearinghouse. But they will not be able to petition a positive or um, test result. So there's existing practices, and they'll be following those for that. Moving down to um, the employer's role, they will also have to register within the clearinghouse. They'll be reporting the drug and alcohol violations. They'll be required to request specific consent on drivers that they want to conduct a query on. They'll also be required to report negative return to duty or controlled substance test results, and then report the completion of a driver's follow-up testing plan. Um, it's like I mentioned before, if the employer is an owner operator and they'll have to indicate that in the clearinghouse, they'll be required to designate a CTPA. Um, and then employers who have a DOT number, they'll actually be able to access the clearinghouse from the portal, so they won't need um, a new username and password. They'll be able to connect from the portal. For queries and consent, um, when are those queries and consent required? First will be pre-employment, and this will ensure that the uh, a prospective employer is eligible to, eligible to perform any safety-sensitive functions, including operating a CMV. And then also the annual verification process, which will be done at a minimum once a year, and it will ensure that the driver is still eligible to perform safety-sensitive functions. Um, for the annual verification, it can be done as a limited query first, which will just indicate if the clearinghouse has any information on the driver, but it will not um, report any of the violation detailed information out. And the consent for the limited query can actually be done outside of the clearinghouse, such as in a driver application or something. Um, the general consent can also be done for an unlimited time or one time, depending on the terms of what that consent is. And then if there's information found within the query, the employer will have to get the specific consent within the clearinghouse, and that will have to be done electronically. I don't know why that didn't quite show up correctly on the screen, but um, this is kind of just a snapshot of what it would look like for the driver. So the driver would get um, into the clearinghouse and they would be able to select I consent or I do not consent. 
and there'll be a warning message to the driver that if they don't consent, then they're not eligible for performing those safety census um, functions. For a consortium or a third party administrator, again, they'll be able to enter the violation, provide um, request consent or query on behalf of the employer. They will register within the clearinghouse. If they choose to have assistance, they'll be able to send an invitation to the assistant and then the assistant will register within the clearinghouse. Um, the CTPA must be selected by the employer before they can report violations or query on behalf of that employer. For a medical review officer, the MROs, they may, may either be self-employed or work for a larger company, but each MRO must register within the clearinghouse and have their own account. The MROs will be able to enter drug and alcohol violation information, and again, if they choose, they might they may um, register assistance to enter the violation information. Similarly, with the substance abuse professional, they um, may work for a company or be self-employed. They'll enter the return to duty information within the clearinghouse, and they may designate an assistant if they chose, choose to. The driver then must identify what staff will be um, permitted to enter their detailed information. So the staff must register and the driver must choose them. Um, and just like the MROs, each staff individually must have their own uh, username and password account in the clearinghouse. Regarding the assistants, all of them must actually be invited to register within the clearinghouse. Um, the CPPAs can enter violation information or query on behalf of um, the authorized CTPA, that's the assistant, the MRO will be able to enter violation information, the staff assistant will be able to enter the return to duty information. A CTPA assistant may support multiple CTPAs, as the same thing with an MRO assistant or a staff assistant. So if there's an MRO office and there's four MROs, you might have one assistant who supports all four of those MROs, the system will be able to support that um, configuration. So coming soon, just to revisit the time frame a little bit, um, in the fall of 2019, you'll be able to register for the clearinghouse. Um, you'll be able to register if you're a company, if you're an enforcement user, if you're a driver. Um, if you're an employer, you can designate your CTPA. You can set up assistance if you have them. And we're encouraging drivers to go ahead and register early so that when the time comes, when the system turns live in January 2020, they'll be able to provide consent as, um, as it comes in and won't have to then go through the process of registering. So for more information, this is the coming soon page, the HTTPS uh, clearinghouse.fmcsa.dot.gov. We're expecting to release that hopefully in the next coming days or weeks by the end of March at the latest. Um, and this is where you can subscribe for updates. You can read frequently asked questions or download the fact sheet. The address here, clearinghouse.doc.gov, is live now. Um, and if you have specific questions after the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and use that to contact us. Um, you can also give that address out if you have MROs or drivers or staff or employers who have questions about the clearinghouse. Um, and that is the end of our presentation, so I think I'll turn it over to Brenda if there are any questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Appreciate that presentation. I do not see any questions in the chat box at this time. So if anyone has any questions for either uh, Barbara and G or for Brad and uh, Christine, feel free to go ahead and type those in. This was actually a really great follow-up to the discussion that we had at our summit uh, last November. Um, obviously, the discussion at the summit last November was focused mostly around uh, cannabis um, or the decriminalization of marijuana here in the United States. Uh, in particular in Colorado and Washington. And there are quite a few questions, you know, from um, the summit attendees, you know, regarding if anyone knew what was happening in Canada and, how, you know, how that was going and how they were addressing it. So we really appreciate that information from Brad and Christine. That was, that was great. And I'm sure that uh, we might hold another follow-up webinar in another uh, six months, nine months, um, to see if there's any additional um, research and analysis that's been done in that area. And some of the other questions, of course, were around if FMCSA was doing anything to address the kick. Canadian as well, so it was also really great information about the um, I still do not see any questions. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in. 
there is oh. one question there. Thank you, Chris. I just saw that. Will violations that end up in the clearinghouse be pushed out to employers or will it require an active query? So violations will not be pushed out except in one specific scenario. So it will require an active query by the employer. If, a, if an employer does a query, a full query, and then a violation is entered on that driver within the next 30 days, then we will send a notification out to the employer saying that there is new information on a driver that you have previously queried. But other than that, we will not be pushing out the information to the employers. Great. Thanks, Barbara. Are there any other questions? Uh, Brad and Christine, did you have any additional information you'd like to add? Uh, no, 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 nothing. Not Great. All right. Thanks again, everyone. We'll continue to monitor if there's any additional questions. But thanks again, Brad, Christine, Barbara, and G for your presentation today and for all the great information. As I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, this is the second in a series of webinars as part of our Commercial Vehicle Safety Center. And we will be sending out the announcement for our next webinar soon. Uh, you can view all the slides and recordings of past webinars on our Commercial Vehicle Safety Center website. And the link for this is posted in the chat box if you don't have that handy. Um, another goal of our center is to provide resources and assistance to help establish partnerships between agencies, industry, and universities. I think you heard a lot of the discussion um, uh, in the original presentation today around the type of research that's needed. So if you're interested in forming a partnership or would like more information, please reference our website or feel free to contact me directly. Thanks again, everyone, for your attendance today. And I'll turn it over to Chris to close the session. OK. I don't think I have anything else to add. There are no additional questions. so. I'll just echo the same thing. Thank you for sharing this information. Um, I found it to be extremely beneficial and very informative. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.